Hello everyone, welcome back. Today we are looking at economic analysis of financial regulation. We have looked at the problems of asymmetric information like moral hazard and adverse selection before. And we've also referred to the fact that the financial sector is one of the most heavily regulated sectors of our economy. So we're going to connect these two and see how financial regulation can reduce the problems of asymmetric information. Before we look at that particular linkage, let's first look at some of the government safety nets that we have in place in our economy and what's the rationale behind them. The need for government safety nets really came out of the phenomena of bank runs and bank panics which we saw in the 1930s during the Great Depression. The Great Depression was triggered by your stock market crash. It wasn't just the stock market tumbling and businesses collapsing but it also brought upon major bank panics and bank failures in our economy. A bank failure is when a bank is unable to meet all of its obligations and if it cannot pay its liabilities it must go out of business and declares insolvency. We saw many such bank failures primarily arising out of the fact that depositors were unable to assess the quality of the bank assets depositors when they don't know the quality of the assets that the bank is holding and they're apprehensive about the bank's viability they will withdraw their money so in the event if one bank is failing it will lead to a system-wide bank contagion effect we'll see lots of people running to the bank and withdrawing their money that's exactly what i was referring to during the great depression there were thousands of people lining up outside of banks here is an example of a bank in new york city where you can see crowds gathered outside the bank in order to withdraw their money banks do not have enough reserves available to meet all of these debt obligations. They will not be able to cater to all of these withdrawal requests and therefore declare insolvency. So we saw many such bank runs in the economy, many banks declaring insolvency thereafter, and this problem further exacerbated the intensity of the Great Depression. A government safety net will try and short circuit this bank run and the bank contagion. First one of these that we can look at is our deposit insurance. Before deposit insurance, in the event of a failure, depositors would have to wait until the bank was liquidated to get their money back. So as soon as they feared a bank failure, they would immediately go and withdraw their money. And in the case of a system-wide panic, depositors are now withdrawing money even from good banks. Deposit insurance in Canada, which is conducted through your Canada Deposit Insurance Corporation, ensures all deposits up to a limit of hundred thousand dollars this insurance as a depositor ensures that even if the bank was to declare insolvency you will still get your money back as long as the deposit is off or below hundred thousand dollars insurance therefore will short circuit the bank failure and the contagion effect. Now this pandemic will not be system wide. In fact, we can just restrict it to just that one particular troubled bank. Deposit insurance in Canada works particularly with two methods. We have the payoff method and we have the purchase and assumption method. In the payoff method, we allow the bank to fail and all deposits up to a limit of $100,000 are fully insured and will get their money back. However, in the purchase and assumption method, the bank is reorganized by finding a merging partner who takes over the liabilities of the failed bank. No depositors, creditors lose money. So this is in effect 100% insurance. CDIC also supports the merging partner by giving it subsidized loans. Another type of government safety net is your lender of last resort. In this case, it's your central bank which is playing this role. It can step in and provide support to the troubled institutions by acting as the lender of last resort. Bank of Canada has its standing liquidity facilities to help out financial institutions which are in need of emergency funds. Government can also step in and provide funds directly. An example of this we saw during the big financial crisis when the US Treasury provided big bailouts to large financial institutions like the AIG and Bear Stearns. We have also seen the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation doing this in order to bail out big banks. Lastly, we have nationalization. Nationalization is when the government completely takes over the troubled institution. So both the ownership and management of the bank is taken over by the government. In this case, again, all creditors and depositors of the institution are completely safe and they're guaranteed to get their money back. Nationalization, however, is not politically popular and therefore it is not often used. Government safety nets once put in place will create their own set of asymmetric information problems. So we see because of them we'll actually see both moral hazard and adverse selection rising. So in the case of moral 
example has it recall the example of insurance once you have insurance you are more likely to take on risk so for example if you have insurance against auto theft you're more likely to leave your car keys in the car or leave your engine running etc so we see people with insurance are more prone to taking on excessive risk thereby increasing the moral hazard problem likewise in deposit insurance once depositors know that the bank is insured or the deposits are fully insured they are less likely to monitor the bank closely they will not be focusing on what type of assets the bank is holding and therefore they will not impose market discipline by withdrawing their deposits if they feel the bank is in trouble now with this lack of monitoring in place we'll see the financial institutions will be taking on excessive risk because they know that their activities are not being monitored likewise we see the existence of deposit insurance and thereby lack of monitoring on the part of depositors will attract people who are risk lovers to this industry so type a personalities ambitious people aggressive people people who are willing to take on excessive risk are the ones who are attracted to the industry now again remember this is primarily because depositors have little reason to monitor the activities of the bank or the financial institution so having the safety net yes does prevent system-wide bank failures and the contagion effect however it does increase our asymmetric information problem another government safety net is your too big to fail too big to fail refers to the situation when your regulators are reluctant to close down the large financial institutions and impose losses on their creditors because doing so might trigger a financial crisis support is therefore given to institutions even if they are not entitled to it but merely because they are too big once large depositors know that the bank is too big to fail again they have no incentive to monitor the bank with lack of monitoring this will again increase the moral hazard problems at the big banks and we saw this happening prior to the financial crisis of 2008 2009 big financial conglomerates like the aig lehman brothers bear stearns were taking on excessive risk and they subsequently collapsed some of these were bailed out like the aig and Bear Stearns. However, Lehman Brothers was not bailed out and was allowed to fail. Because of the fact that when a large institution collapses, it will have a tremendous impact on the whole economy. There is a huge political pressure on governments to bail out these large institutions. And therefore, bigger the financial institution, the more likelihood of it being bailed out eventually. And that will inherently increase the moral hazard problem prevalent within these institutions so the managers of these institutions know that they will be bailed out and therefore they will be taking on just way too much risk let's now look at financial regulations that are designed in order to reduce the information asymmetry problems whether it be moral hazard or adverse selection here are eight types of regulations that we're going to examine and see how will they reduce different types of information gaps first one over here we have is restriction on asset holdings again the problem is lack of monitoring and because we do not have enough monitoring banks will be prone to taking on too much risk so we are trying to curb the problem of moral hazard regulators can reduce this excessive risk taking by putting restrictions on the type of assets that financial institutions can hold and the most common example of that is prohibiting financial institutions from holding common stock stock market as you know is quite volatile it responds very quickly to business cycle changes and cause major disruptions and losses on your asset side when the regulator puts restrictions on asset holdings they're also now forcing the financial institution to diversify their portfolio of assets this will reduce risk by limiting the amount of load in particular categories or to individual borrowers the second most common type of regulation that we see is in terms of your capital requirement just like collateral reduces more moral hazard for an individual behavior, higher capital will reduce the moral hazard on the part of our financial institution. Capital, remember, is simply the difference between total assets and total liabilities. So higher the amount of capital, the more skin in the game. The financial institution is now more likely to take less risk. So it is going to reduce our moral hazard problem. There are two types of capital requirements. The first one is your simple category in which you're just calculating the leverage ratio. Leverage ratio is your total capital divided by total assets. As long as the leverage ratio is 5% or above, you're considered a well capitalized financial institution. If the leverage ratio is below 3%, you're considered undercapitalized and in this case we'll see increased regulatory restrictions on that particular bank or financial institution. 
students. Now let's go ahead and look at our second type of capital requirement. The second one is called your risk-based capital requirement. Basel Accord was implemented as a way to combat the problem of risky assets and off-balance sheet activities. Here the banks are allowed to hold at least 8% of their risk-weighted assets as capital. All assets of the bank are allocated in four main categories, each with a different weight to reflect the degree of the credit risk. Off-balance sheet activities are treated the same way. They are assigned a credit equivalent percentage that will convert them to an on-balance sheet activity to which an appropriate risk weight will apply. This is where the bank is exposing itself to a lot of risk. Some example of off-balance sheet activities are their loan sales. Then we have activities that generate fee income for the bank. These could be foreign exchange trades, servicing mortgages-backed securities, guaranteeing debt, and additional backup lines of credit. The third type of category over here is your trading activities. Financial institutions these days are involved in many trading activities which would be exposing the bank to a lot of risk. These could be activities directly done by the bank or through its subsidiaries and therefore they will not be reflected on its balance sheet at all. Trading activities that can have a lot of exposure to risk are trading in financial futures, financial options, in different type of foreign exchanges and swaps. Let's look at an example. Here we have the risk weights attached to different type of assets. So cash and equivalent risk weight is zero. Likewise for government securities, especially securities issued by your OECD governments, these are very safe. So the risk weight is again zero. So when you have a zero risk weight, that is telling you that the bank does not need to hold any capital against these extremely safe assets. However, you can see the risk weights are now gradually rising. So the more riskier the asset, higher is the risk weight associated with them. If you have interbank loans, these are when banks are borrowing and lending to each other, a 20% risk weight. If you have given loans out to a household in the form of mortgages, there's a considerably higher risk weight of 50% or 0.5. For any commercial and industrial loans, also individual loans, Loans, risk weight is 100% or 1. And therefore, you can see if your portfolio of assets is made up of relatively risky assets, Basel 1 now requires them to hold a bigger amount of capital against these risk weighted assets. As an example over here, we have the asset profile of a bank. The bank is holding reserves. So this is cash held by the bank, different type of securities, and then different type of loans. The last column over here is giving me my weighted assets. Because reserves and securities have no risk associated with them, I do not need to hold any capital against it. So my weighted asset becomes zero. Municipal bonds do not have the same risk weight as the treasury bills issued by the federal government. So we see a much higher risk weight attached to them. And overall, my risk weighted asset becomes from 10 to 5. So against 5 million worth of municipal bonds, I will need to hold 8% of capital. Likewise, given the risk weights associated with these different type of loans, we can calculate our weighted assets. My total weighted assets in this case are coming out to be $107 million and my total assets are otherwise 150. Now let's compare the minimum capital requirement, the traditional requirement of 5% against your total assets versus the 8% requirement against your risk weighted assets. The first one is your minimum capital requirement based on your traditional leverage ratio. So my total assets are 150 million and I'm required to now keep at least 5% of 150 million in order to be considered well capitalized. And this will give you $7.5 million, assuming all the units are in millions. So we know the bank is now required to keep at least $7.5 million as capital in order to be considered well capitalized. However, on the Basel requirement, which requires you to keep 8% of your risk weighted assets, we'll get a completely different number. In this case, I'm getting $8.56 million. So based on our hypothetical example of Bank ABC, because Bank ABC was exposed to some risk given the characteristics of the assets that it was holding, we see that its requirement of capital also increases along with the exposure to risk. If your assets are very risky, you can see the capital requirement will automatically increase according to Basel 1. If you're holding relatively safer assets, your capital requirement according to the Basel 1 will automatically go down. And we can always extend this example to a more complex situation in which I'm also converting my off balance sheet activities, for example, different type of trading or fee from income activities into my on balance sheet activities by assigning particular weights to those different activities. So one which requires 
requires you to hold 8% of your risk weighted assets as capital is not without its own set of problems. The aftermath of the financial crisis forced us to analyze what banks were doing. And we saw a lot of financial institutions and banks engaging in what we call regulatory arbitrage. Regulatory arbitrage refers to the fact that banks are keeping assets with same risk weight but relatively higher risk, therefore paying higher return, and taking off assets in the same category which are relatively low risk and therefore giving them low return. So regulatory measure of the bank risk may be very different from the actual risk that the bank faces. An example of this could be a bank giving out loans to a very risky corporation A and not to a safe corporation, let's say firm B. Good loans in this case are going off the books and bad loans are piling up on your books. This leads to increasing the problem of adverse selection. Remember adverse selection? It's when you have only lemons in the market. Loans are being given to high risk, high return borrowers and not to good quality borrowers. You're now exposing the bank to a lot of risk while at the same time satisfying the regulator by showing them that the most of the loans are of safer category. Whereas within that category, you're taking advantage of different risk characteristics across those borrowers. Aftermath of the financial crisis forced regulators to look at how to control this regulatory arbitrage. So they have come up with Basel II and more recently we have what we call the Basel III. Basel III is specifically designed to ensure financial financial stability, not just within a particular economy, but also trying to ensure financial stability across borders. To understand Basel III, we can split it into three main pillars. Pillar 1 focuses on minimum capital requirements. The capital requirements are now linked to three types of risks, market risk, credit risk, and operational risk. So we have now more categories of risk and many more risk weights. Pillar 2 focuses on strengthening the supervisory process. It's looking at the quality of risk management, whether banks have adequate procedures in place, for determining how much capital they need. Through the third pillar, regulators are empowering the creditors and depositors of these large financial institutions by making sure that more information is disclosed to them in terms of the quality of asset profiles of these banks, who is running them, and how are they running them. Most of Basel III recommendations are followed by banks in Canada. However, in terms of international implementation, there is still a lot more to be desired. Moving on, we have the third type of regulation that is your prompt corrective action. Now, if a bank has low levels of capital, it is more likely to fail. In order to see that, let's look at the balance sheet of this hypothetical bank. Its overall assets are worth $30 million. Its total liabilities are at $29 million. Its capital right now is of $1 million. The leverage ratio of this bank is only 3%. So with 3% of leverage ratio, we already know that this bank is considered undercapitalized. Why is this a problem? If there was a shock to the asset side of this bank, so let's say they make some losses on their assets, even if they incur a loss of a million dollars, that will immediately bring their capital to zero. With a slightly bigger shock, the capital can actually become negative. With negative capital, the bank can no longer meet its debt obligations and has to declare insolvency. So this is a troubled bank, more likely to default, more likely to fail. So with low cushions of capital, we see that the bank is now more likely to take on even higher risk. Seeing this low cushion of capital, the CDIC, that is your deposit insurance corporation, intervenes quickly and vigorously, penalizing the bank with higher insurance premium, forcing it to increase its capital, among many other things. The next regulation that we have is of financial supervision. There are two main forms of financial supervision. The first one is chartering and then we have on-site examinations. Chartering refers to screening of proposals for new institutions. So who will be running these institutions? It's a way of addressing the adverse selection problem. We do not want high risk taking individuals to be attracted to this industry. Once a bank receives its charter, chartered banks are required to file periodic call reports. These call reports help in revealing banks' assets and liabilities, their income and dividends, ownership of the bank, and their foreign exchange operations. Chartered banks are typically examined by our Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions. OSFI, CDIC, which is Canada Deposit Insurance Corporation, and the Central Bank, Bank of Canada itself. On the other side, we have our CAMELS rating. CAMELS rating are based on six factors, capital adequacy, asset quality, management, earnings, liquidity, and sensitivity to market risk. The CAMELS rating given by the bank examiner is too low. Regulator can issue a cease and desist order to change the bank's behavior. As you can see, CAMELS rating are designed in order to curb the risk-taking behavior of financial institutions, and therefore they are trying to reduce our moral hazard problem. Next in line, we have assessment of risk management. Our traditional examination 
regulations focus on quality of bank's balance sheet at a particular point in time, whether it is complying with capital and asset holding requirements. However, financial innovation has allowed banks and financial institutions to take on too much risk through many different new markets and financial instruments. A relatively healthy financial institution can approach insolvency very quickly. This new environment has shifted the focus to banks' management with regard to controlling risk. Therefore, we have a separate risk management rating from 1 to 5 that feeds into our CAMELS rating. Now, risk management controls could be in the form of separation of front and back rooms, value at risk modeling, and stress testing. So, trying to analyze what is the exposure to overall risk by this financial institution and what is the total value at stake over here. So, instead of looking at your traditional calculations of risk exposure through standard deviation, we are now looking at the doomsday approach. What is the worst case scenario or the total value at risk even if the probability of that happening is very very low. So these value at risk modeling is a better way of analyzing the overall risk exposure of the financial institution to different shocks in the economy. In assessing the risk management, regulators are encouraging banks to pay a lot more attention to risk management and not just rely on the traditional CAMELS rating. Then we have financial regulations focusing on disclosure requirements. Recall that the free riding problem in trying to address adverse selection and moral hazard does not allow enough information to be produced privately. Shareholders and depositors will not have the incentive to produce information. To address this problem, regulators require financial institutions to adhere to disclosure requirements and they encourage them to disclose wide range of information. Examples of these are seen through our provincial securities commissions which impose disclosure requirements on all corporations and financial institutions that issue publicly traded securities that is stocks and bonds that are traded publicly we also saw the basel 2 and basel 3 accords putting particular emphasis in requiring banks to provide additional disclosure regarding their off balance sheet activities then we have the bill 198 by the ontario government in 2002 that increased the incentives to produce accurate audits of corporate income statements and balance sheets and put in place regulations to limit conflicts of interest in the financial services industry. The main purpose of all of these is again the same, that we want to bridge the information gap between the two parties, be it the depositors and managers of these financial institutions, or the shareholders and the managers of these financial institutions. With more information available at large, there will be less likelihood of adverse selection and moral hazard in our financial system. Number seven is our regulation around consumer protection. Asymmetric information causes consumers to take out loans that they don't understand. We especially saw this during the financial crisis that a lot of borrowers had taken out loans that they did not understand and they did not know the true cost of their borrowing. In the United States, the most infamous of these were referred to as the ninja loans, where the borrower had no income, no job, no assets, but were still allowed to borrow huge amounts of money. As a result, when the housing bubble burst, there were millions of foreclosures, putting massive pressure on our financial structure. As weak consumer protection played a major role in exacerbating the financial crisis, there has been now increased emphasis on providing more information to consumers. This consumer protection revolves around allowing consumers to know the true cost of borrowing or truth in lending. It also involves having complete disclosure of standardized interest rate or the annual percentage rate that the consumer or the borrower will be paying. These also include having the borrowers know total finance charges, including any fees other than the interest rate or the cost of borrowing. It also includes the method of assessing these finance charges. There is emphasis on having full disclosure on how these finance charges are assessed and imposed on the borrower. Lastly, we see that consumer protections requires that if there is any information gap that can be bridged as soon as possible. Beefing up regulation in this regard will hopefully prevent further the crisis from happening. The last financial regulation we have is of restrictions on competition. Financial industry it does not have free entry. There are effective barriers to entry for new firms to enter this industry. And regulators want to keep it like that in order to increase the profits of the existing firms or existing financial institutions. Because with higher competition, we'll see lower prices and lower profits for our incumbent firms. And with lower profitability, likelihood of increasing moral hazard problems. Why? Because managers of these financial 
financial institutions will be now more likely to take on risk in order to increase their profit margins. Therefore, we see regulators not allowing new firms to enter this industry easily. However, there are always two sides to the coin. In this case, disadvantage would be in for the consumers. Consumers end up paying very high prices, higher fees for different types of financial services being offered by these banks. And these higher charges also come along with decreased efficiency. Recall from your basic principles of micro that whenever we have restriction on competition in an industry compared to perfectly competitive industry, we end up paying higher prices and less quantity exchanged. Likewise, over here, we see financial sectors which are highly regulated will end up charging a lot more and overall quantity exchanged will be a lot lower. However, regulators are willing to take on these costs because they feel that the advantages that come with the reduction in moral hazard definitely outweigh the cost in terms of efficiency 